by making some unplanned remarks uh, based on things that I've been thinking about as I've been listening to the other presenters. One is that it seems to me that the whole rest and flotation field can be divided into two major threads or major, major approaches. One is what you might call from the inside out. That is, people who have had various kinds of experiences while floating or with experiences analogous to floating um, and have gained various kinds of um, subjective uh, reactions like uh, you know, increased uh, self-understanding, uh, some new connection, cognitive connection or emotional connection with the universe, things like that, which they then extrapolate and, and conclude that this is kind of a general um, effect of the experience. The other approach is from the outside in, and that is people who may or may not have floated but have some ideas about what the effects of severely reduced external stimulation might be on the brain and on other parts of the human organism, and then do tests to find out whether they're right. So in the first case, the ideas come from the experience. In the second case, what you look at is what you think might be relevant, might be affected, not on the basis of what you experienced while you were floating necessarily, but on the basis of some other theoretical uh, standpoint. Secondly, I want to point out, I'm not going to talk about the entire history of uh, reduced stimulation. And just to remind you briefly, that history goes back far beyond any kind of uh, research or even systematized experience with rest. That is, uh, we know it from ancient Greece, uh, the Oracle of Delphi, for example. People who consulted her went through a reduced stimulation experience. And in many other times and cultures, uh, people did that for gaining self-understanding or for uh, establishing contact with supernatural beings, God, um, spirits, uh, guidance, guiding animals, uh, angels, and so on. And for example, the uh, major figures in the major religions of our time uh, all experienced their enlightenment or their contact with the being that gave them uh, their new religious ideas under conditions of reduced stimulation. Whether in a cave like Muhammad, on a mountaintop like Moses and Jesus, in a forest under a tree like the Buddha, and so on. This is a, a well-known uh, stimulus for spiritual thought and connection. The third thing I want to say is how ironic it is that some of our uh, going from the inside out and going from the outside in experiences uh, connect in interesting ways. For example, a couple of people have mentioned that in flotation and in other forms of rest as well, uh, the right hemisphere of the brain becomes more active and more dominant or at least less oppressed or suppressed by the left brain, the left half of the brain, than is usual. Well, how can we document that? Okay, that from the inside out, we know that people in rest have creative ideas, they have um, vivid dreams and daydreams, uh, they have free-flowing thoughts and so on, all anecdotally, but if you want to support that with evidence, you have to call on the left brain to design experiments to show that in flotation, the, rest brain the left brain doesn't work that well. It's an interesting bit of irony. OK, now I'm going to tell you what I was planning to tell you. <laughs> um, I'm going to go through the history of not only flotation rest, but um, chamber rest as well, from the invention of both in the 1950s until the present time. And in each case, I'm going to give you, I'm going to go through it decade by decade and in each case, I'm going to give you the decade and what was happening during that period in the methodology of rest and in what was being looked at by scientists who are using the technique. I've got some illustrations of the uh, facilities that were then used. 
Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the results. And then I'm, I've got a, a set of slides that are entitled um, uh, in, in terms of why wasn't the technique more acceptable in general and specifically to mainstream scientists. And I think that's an important issue because if the, if the um, movement is to develop as well as it might, it's important to get the scientists on your side. And I know there are some people who don't believe that, uh, who think that the uh, inside out technique is sufficient. But for example, we just heard that flotation providers are not qualified to treat. But wouldn't it be nice if the people who are qualified to treat, to treat would refer their patients to flotation providers? And that could happen in a lot of cases because we know that flotation is helpful in a whole series of symptoms and disorders that it could be used to help the treatment, uh, but it isn't because the scientists don't believe it. So, onward. 1950s and 60s is when it all started, as you probably know. And it was invented at McGill University in uh, Montreal, Canada. Yay. <laughs> um, and also, more or less simultaneously, uh, the tank version was invented by uh, John Lilly and Jay Shirley. Interestingly, Jay Shirley's name seems to have disappeared from the history, although John and he worked together right from the beginning um, at NIH. And, uh, and Jay Shirley was fully involved in, uh, in the research, at any rate. Um, the results were dramatic, very dramatic. As it says there, mostly negative, including all kinds of hallucinations you may have run across in your introductory psych text, um, the uh, line of squirrels marching across the visual field and things like that. Um, the subjects in the McGill experiments ex uh, reported uh, violent and major mood swings they were very stressed, they were disoriented, and most of them quit before the scheduled end of the experiment. But those were multi-day experiments, so we have to remember that. It's quitting before the end of the experiment. Uh, they might still, many of them still stayed in for several days. There were approximately 25 different terms for this technique. Everybody who jumped into the field made up their own term. Hebb and company, called it perceptual isolation. Um, somebody else called it sensory deprivation, perceptual diminution, all kinds of names. And you were, could never quite be sure that they were talking about the same thing. And they were interpreting it on the basis of a variety of different theories. As it turns out, they were not talking about the, straight, the same thing. And I'll show you in a minute why. Okay, here's some examples. This is the perceptual isolation chamber at McGill. And as you see, the subject is wearing big cardboard cuffs, so his hands couldn't feel anything either. Um, uh, goggles, which were translucent, so you couldn't see any patterned perception, but there was constant light, and uh, a constant white noise was fed into the chamber. And that's what it looked like from the subject, if you looked at the subject closely, okay? Now, you think about this, and it took, it took us a while to realize that what you're having here is constant overstimulation, right? There's constant light, there's constant noise. How is that deprivation of stimulus input? It isn't. Here is John Lilly and Jay Shirley's original tank, what they call the hydrohypodynamic environment. For some reason, that never caught on as the term for it. <laughs> Now, John didn't find that very stressful, and I don't think Jay did either from when I talked to him about it, but naive subjects did, okay? Here you are in a tank completely submerged in water, something that through evolution we have learned to fear because you drown, right? And you had a mask on. There it is. Nice, eh? Um, so you had a mask on, and you were told that there's an air hose and that leads to an air pump, and there was a monitor there Nice. There's a monitor there who would make sure the pump was working. 
Well, suppose the monitor had to go to the bathroom. Suppose the monitor went on a coffee break, and suppose the pump stopped just then. The first time you would realize it was when you drowned. It's not a reassuring kind of thought. So those subjects also experienced high stress. Barriers to acceptance, okay. McGill University Laboratory reported, as I said, subjects were scared, anxious, they had all these hallucinations. The McGill people did some interesting studies which they thought and reported showed that people became more persuasible under these conditions, it's a matter of opinion, um, and cognitive decrements on various kinds of intellectual performance tests. And the research themselves were afraid that might, they might psychologically damage the subject. So how did they deal with that? They dealt with that by putting a big panic button in the, in the room and by having the subject sign a legal release form that if they experienced psychological damage, they wouldn't sue. Okay. You can imagine how reassuring that must have been when you showed up for the experiment. And I can tell you that my own experience, my first experience with rest, was, was then called sensory deprivation, was not at, at McGill, but we also had panic button and legal release forms, and this was the first time it occurred to me that I might, in fact, be in trouble as a result of this experiment. I was told if you push the panic button, a bell will sound that can be heard all through the building, and people will run to let you out. I thought, my God, what kind of emergency is this going to be? And then I had to sign the legal release form, and I thought, uh-oh, you know. I lasted three hours before I pushed the button. On top of that, this was at the time of the Korean War, and shortly thereafter, and there were all kinds of rumors floating around that this was a technique that was used by uh, the Chinese and Korean military on prisoners of war from the West to brainwash them and turn them into communists. Okay? Um, there's only two things wrong with that. One is it didn't happen at all, or hardly at all. And secondly, they didn't use reduced stimulation. In fact, they used excessive stimulation. Anyway, from the other laboratories, we got similar kinds of reports. Plus, people couldn't speak clearly or couldn't speak at their normal rate. Uh, they had very unpleasant fantasies, mood swings, and so forth. And they regressed to a more primitive state of thought. This was called a model psychosis, which is a pretty scary label, too. Okay. So people did not really think that this was a technique that was very good to keep exploring. Um, and it was primarily used and primarily interpreted in terms of all of these dramatic and negative effects. In the next decade, 1960s to 70s, a lot of the people who were doing the early research dropped out of the field. Uh, they did kind of one-shot studies and then quit. We're not really that interested in the field. And they began, some people, those who stayed in the field, um, the major one being John Zubek at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada, um, started doing uh, parametric research such as varying, systematically varying the length of the uh, uh, rest period from starting with a few hours up to several days, looking at how the effects changed over time, um, and then also uh, imposing restriction on one modality at a time. So they would have subject in one experiment uh, with in darkness, but there was sound and mobility was not, in, not uh, restricted and so on. There was another study in which they put people in a very restrictive kind of box, but with normal light and sound and so forth. And so they were looking at how it affected these different uh, sensory modalities, if you varied it one at a time. Dark and silent sensory deprivation chambers, which were introduced by Jack Vernon at Princeton, who was my mentor, uh, became the, more, the most dominant uh, form of chamber rest while John Lilly was um, developing a, a more acceptable form of tank rest. And there were now quite a few labs uh, in a number of countries, as, as the slide shows. And best of all, from my point of view, I think, was the elimination of experimental artifacts such as the panic button, uh, 
the legal release form, and that kind of thing. And it turned out that when you did away with those, then the early HEB and company results did not hold up. They could not be replicated. In other words, if you take away the irrelevant procedures that scared the subject before he or she even went into the chamber, then you didn't get these negative outcomes. Sensory deprivation itself, as shortly after we started calling it rest, uh, sensory deprivation itself did not produce major hallucinations, mood swings, anxiety, fear, and all that stuff. That was due to the way in which the subjects were put into the situation. And the, the rate at which people left the experiment early went down to someplace around 5%, a very low. Okay. Uh, there's a reference there to John Zubek's uh, excellent review book on the subject. Up to, the, up to the time it was published, 1969. So we got the modern flotation tank from Glenn and Lee and John, which was certainly much better than being totally immersed in the water. And that's the way it looked to the subject in the sensory deprivation. So you have to imagine, you know, in reality, of course, it was all black. So. I tried to bring a picture of that, but I thought it would not be terribly informative. <laughs> I came close, though. This is a picture of my sensory deprivation chamber at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Yay. Canada. <laughs> right. <laughs> so this, the subject lies on the bed over here. Uh, in the foreground is a cooler in which we had liquid diet food, which was essentially bland in taste. We didn't want to stimulate them uh, through the taste buds either. At the foot of the bed is a chemical toilet, so they did not have to leave the chamber in order to urinate. And we asked them to defecate before they went in. And um, there was a desk for after, after the uh, experiment. Uh, we sometimes had to put the lights on and had them take tests, which were on the table there. And there was also an intercom. Uh, and they were told that um, the door was not locked, which was true, of course, and if they wanted to leave before the experiment was over, they could do two things. One was the intercom was on all the time, and there was a monitor outside all the time. All they had to do is say, I want to quit, let me out. Or if they didn't want to do that, all they had to do was get up and walk out of the door. Okay? So that reduced anxiety quite considerably. Here are some results, and I have to tell you, this is not a systematic lit review, uh, just a couple of uh, uh, data graphs from, from our own research. But we started using it, and I originally started to try to replicate the uh, HEB results on persuasibility. So we did some attitude change studies in which we played tapes, persuasive tapes, into the chamber. And then I decided it would be nice to do it on something that had some real life relevance and some behavioral um, data. And so we tried to get people to quit smoking. And what did we find? Well, what we found was that 24 hours of sensory deprivation led to, two years later, people smoking approximately half as much as they had before they went into the chamber. That was pretty impressive. Smoking is very recalcitrant to treatment, you probably know. Within a year, usually the uh, relapse rate is 80 to 90 percent, and people are smoking essentially as much as they had before the treatment. But this is with real psychotherapeutic treatments. I was quite surprised. I didn't believe the data. We did a number of replications. Other people did some replications, and they hold up very well. If you combine them, if you combine rest or sensory deprivation, with a more standard behavioral, cognitive behavioral, uh, or similar technique, uh, the data are even better. Apparently, the results of the two techniques summate, so the uh, success of one technique is added to the success of the uh, sensory deprivation procedure, uh, and the relapse rate is uh, even lower. So that was quite encouraging. Well, why didn't it catch on more? Unfortunately, the brainwashing accusation became revived because in the 1970s, there was a considerable amount of propaganda 
about sensory deprivation being used to torture uh, suspected terrorists in a number of places around the world, including in Northern Ireland and West Germany. Again, um, what the facts were, were that these suspects were interrogated uh, by having hoods put over their heads so they couldn't identify the people who were interrogating them or the witnesses against them. It had nothing to do with wanting to reduce the amount of stimulation they were getting. And also, they were beaten. They were, uh, you've probably seen on TV where the cops surround some suspect and shout at him incessantly. They did that. Uh, they made them stand against the wall in painful positions for long periods of time. So it was all overstimulation, not understimulation. But the facts take a long time to catch up with the accusations. And a lot of the researchers did not want to subject themselves to what happened to some. Uh, Jan Gross, who was a Czech psychologist who became a refugee to Germany, was, was attacked by uh, leftist German students. Uh, John Zubeck was accused of having uh, done research on brainwashing. Now, he, was, he was doing research on perceptual and motor effects, had nothing to do with brainwashing at all. Um, I had done the research on smoking and persuasibility, and I said, if you want to send those people over to UBC from the University of Manitoba, I will welcome them, uh, but they didn't come. But, they, but John was, was very severely attacked uh, his daughter was threatened in school and so on. So you can imagine that deterred a lot of people from uh, accepting these data and, and doing the research further. 1970s and 80s was a good time. Um, you may not be familiar with the term salutogenesis. There's, there are two terms that were uh, introduced by an Israeli sociologist named Aaron Antonovsky. Uh, pathogenesis, that is uh, disease producing, and salutogenesis, which is health producing. So we moved in the 70s and 80s from looking at the negative effects of rest, <clears throat> now we were calling it rest, thanks to Rod, <clears throat> and um, who will be speaking tomorrow, Rod Bory, um, and uh, uh, looking more at the positive effects. When we introduced the term rest, restricted environmental stimulation technique or restricted environmental stimulation therapy, depending on what use you are putting it to. John Lilly suggested that we, uh, that the acronym should stand for Restore Energy Simply Traveling. Um, the kind of traveling he was doing was not the kind of traveling we were doing, so um, I didn't accept that. <laughs> but uh, we found, and other people found, and you know, when I say we, it wasn't only we, there were other people doing this research, um, memory improved uh, after a period of sensory deprivation or rest. You put people in the, in the tank, or the, well, we were doing the chamber at that time. Put people in the chamber after having listened to a passage from a book, tested them 24 hours later, and they remembered much more than people who had done their usual activities in between for 24 hours. <clears throat> um, and we used it also for, for checking uh, athletic skills of various sorts, perceptual motor coordination, and for a number of uh, clinical uses. So we we'll go back again to, you know, flotation providers are not qualified to, to, um, to treat people, but um, it's not something that you can't solve. So we were looking at things like uh, Henry Adams at uh, St. Elizabeth Hospital in Washington, D.C was looking at uh, putting schizophrenics into a reduced stimulation environment for a while. They showed symptomatic improvement. It didn't cure schizophrenia, but the, their symptoms became less severe. We did the same with autistic children, and we got the same results. Be their th symptoms became much less severe. And they found the, they found the, um, uh, the, the environment quite pleasant, and they wanted to go back afterwards. Uh, one theory is that schizophrenia and autism are um, dysfunctions of the gating system that usually filters out stimulation from the environment so that the patients are, are chronically overstimulated. If you put them in some place where there isn't so much stimulation, it's, then they behave uh, with, with fewer symptoms. Um, and we did, we did a whole lot of studies, and other people did as well, on blood pressure, and some of them have been mentioned before. Uh, blood pressure, muscle tension, 
um, headaches, pain, various sorts, chronic pain, and so forth. What we basically found, and I think I still believe this, was that chamber rest was optimal if we wanted to change behaviors, such as smoking, for example, uh, overeating, um, overeating on, on special favorite foods. You did a, I did a study in Australia which showed that after being in the rest chamber for 24 hours and nothing to eat but your favorite food, which you had identified ahead of time, made you not like that food so much anymore. Uh, as their favorite problem food, we told them. You know, what, people who wanted to lose weight but they couldn't resist, you know, uh, whipped cream or something. We put them in there with nothing to eat but their favorite problem food and they stopped eating it, at least for a while. Um, so we did, I think that for behavior that's governed primarily by the, yeah, the left hemisphere, uh, that is uh, voluntary behaviors or behaviors that were voluntary but became automatic as you got addicted, um, the chamber is optimal. For changes in the autonomic nervous system, uh, stress, muscle, that sort of thing, uh, the tank is better. Now, this was also the decade at which commercial tank facilities began, and, the, and IRIS, the International Arrest Investigators Society, and the first incarnation of FTA were established and started holding meetings. By the way, this was still, in the early part, was still during the Vietnam War, and FTA had another meaning as well. Um, I, some of you remember, I guess. Uh, it had to do with some verb, the army but I won't say what it was. Anyway, um, John Lilly's seminal book, The Deep Self, came out during this decade, and I published a book uh, with help from Rod Bory and a couple of other people uh, with, that reviewed the entire body of research until then. <clears throat> this, by the way, is another <clears throat> uh, chamber study uh, that Rod Bory and I ran. Uh, Rod primarily was responsible for it. And as you can see that curve, that top curve, uh, is the one where people got 24 hours of sensory deprivation and some messages about systematic behavior to lose weight. And as you can see, it was pretty successful. So four months later, they had lost on the average of around 11 and a half pounds, which is not bad. And we're still going up. We also did a study on scientific creativity during this period, late, late in the period. Okay. Uh, the next period was 1980s to 90s, where the work went almost entirely in the direction of applied research, commercial flotation facilities spread around the world and became much more visible. Uh, there are lots of magazine articles and newspaper articles and so on about them, interviews with people who had floated, interviews with the, uh, with the facility managers or owners and so forth. The problem was that the research essentially fell apart. Uh, it, it kept going, there was a lot of research, but most of it was very small samples, one, five maybe, not much more than that. Most of them had no control groups or controlled treatments. Um, they were, a scattergun in the sense that there was a study here on this thing and a study there on some other thing and so forth. Nothing really fit together very well. So there were studies of, in the topics that I listed there, stress management, chronic pain, chronic insomnia, uh, phobias, and so on. And most of them came up with positive results, okay? Uh, and there were new theories, including the one about the left brain and the right brain, which was, I think, a step forward from the psychoanalytic theories that dominated the field in the early days. We also found uh, research on cognitive and performance enhancement, skiing, tennis, basketball, dart throwing, archery, rifle shooting, et cetera, et cetera. And again, uh, almost all of them reported positive results. And um, also pilot training, which was interesting. Uh, people who were trained on a simulator after sensory deprivation or rest did better uh, as, a, as a consequence of that. 
and a number of studies on various kinds of creativity, scientific creativity, um, and, and at least one on music creativity, uh, by the way, which was recently published. It took a long time. Um, and the chamber rest effectiveness on uh, the habit modification was uh, confirmed by a, by a fa fair number of replications, and also its uh, use in autism and schizophrenia, and also children acting out, children's acting out behavior. Now, acting out behavior was customarily uh, handled by isolating the child. And this was explained, and they found that when the, after a period of isolation, the child was allowed back into the classroom or whatever it was, and behaved better. And this was interpreted as a result of punishment. Time out was a punishment, and in order not to be put back in there, the kid behaved himself or herself after they came out, mostly himself. Um, my interpretation was quite different, which is that in the normal environment, these kids were being overstimulated, too much was going on. You took them out of that aversive state. Overstimulation is not pleasant. Uh, you take them out of that, it allowed them to calm down, get back to a normal state, self-control, and so on, and then they were okay when you put them back. Uh, there was no one really big authoritative book at this time, but four Irish proceedings were held and, their book, and the books published. Uh, the papers that were given at those uh, meetings. Uh, the 1900s to 2000s, nothing much happened. Um, it was kind of, sh kind of a shame. Uh, the commercial facilities were closing down. They were not getting enough customers. Uh, the laboratories were closing down. Uh, funding was disappearing. Uh, people who were interested in the research were disappearing. A lot of people felt that all the important stuff had been done. There wasn't anything much else to do. Um, and th again, the irony was that this was the time at which the general scientific public, at least the psychological and uh, psychological medical public, began to take notice of this treat of this technique, okay? which they had pretty much ignored most of the time. And they, we had several really authoritative reviews by leading people, all of whom said the data are very interesting, the findings are very positive and uh, promising, but because most of the studies, especially the tank studies, were not controlled, did not have good controls, had very small samples and so forth, it was important to do more research to establish them on a firmer footing. One of these studies, by the way, was a three-year study by the U.S. Army uh, on whether they could use, whether sensory deprivation or rest could be used to help train uh, soldiers. So just at the time that the outside world was taking notice and wanting more, uh, the field was disappearing from under us. Um, both IRIS and FTA-1 dissolved, and uh, most of the people who had been doing the research went on to other topics. What happened? Well, as I said, funding was reduced, um, and uh, the interesting ideas many people thought had been already explored, and I'll show you a slide in a minute about the reduced drama. Uh, clinical applications, again, funds, space, and equipment, and the turf wars were sad, and I think it was partly my fault. I was really naive, you know? And I, ex I tried to explain to clinicians that one of the advantages of rest was that they could spend less time with patients because you put the person in rest and you, all you needed was you know, an intern or some other kind of slave and uh, they could monitor, <laughs> they could monitor the, the tank or chamber and the, the therapist could go on and do other things. And I forgot the fact that they get paid by the hour and the idea of my telling them that they didn't have to spend so many hours did not really appeal. So it was a bad strategy. Um, plus, a lot of people thought that uh, this was treading on their ground, that here were people who were not psychiatrists and making uh, recommendations about treatment for um, psycho, psycho patients and so forth. And the, another problem was that there were so many claims of positive results. Okay? People do not believe in panaceas. People do not believe that some particular methodology 
can be effective in dozens and dozens of different problems. And yet that's what we were publishing. Okay? And they wanted to see more evidence that that was the case. And until they saw that evidence, they were not willing to adopt the, or even test uh, the method. Commercial facilities had a problem which I would like to warn you against or about, and that is that when you start a commercial facility in a particular community, de depending on how large it is, um, there is a pool of people who think, yeah, I want to try this. But many of them, once they've tried it, don't want to try it again. And so, as uh, Glenn and Lee said, uh, it's important to foster repeat visitors. Because if you just depend on, one, on the first time visitors, uh, it goes pretty well until that pool is finished and they've done it and then you've got problems. <clears throat> the other thing was that some communities, many communities, made really unreasonable demands on the tank operators um, in, because they didn't, the, you know, the municipal or state um, health departments and such didn't understand what this was all about. And so they tried to find an analog, okay? Uh, and in at least one case, uh, the analog they came up with was a swimming pool. So they required that the operator have a trained and Red Cross certified lifeguard on duty whenever there was somebody floating in case they started to drown. Um, pretty ridiculous. Another barrier to acceptance was mysticism and drugs. Now remember I'm talking about acceptance by the scientific community, not about the public at large. Um, I think, I'm sorry to say, that John's later writings contributed to this. Um, there's a lot of mysticism, a, you know, contact with benevolent spiritual beings and malevolent ones as well. Uh, and his use of drugs along with uh, floating uh, didn't go over too well with, uh, with the scientific community. Um, and his uh, close friendship with uh, Timothy Leary and other people from that uh, coterie uh, were pointed to as impugning somehow the scientific relevance or purity of the work, uh, which I think was truly misguided, uh, but I can understand how it happens. It's sort of guilt by association. And then out came altered states. How many of you have seen altered states? Oh, quite a few, I'm surprised. It's an old movie. Anyway, um, in, in altered states, there is a researcher loosely modeled on John, very loosely, I must say, uh, who takes some mystical South American indigenous drug and goes into floating and eventually turns into a pre-human uh, ape. And he goes into the zoo and starts killing antelopes and eating them raw and that kind of stuff. And there's the, uh, there's the poster. The most terrifying experiment in the history of science is out of control. Okay. Would you really want to go into a tank after you see that? I don't know. Uh, I'm a fan of Gilbert and Sullivan. And when I watched the movie, I was waiting as he was regressing further and further back for him to uh, come to the point of uh, Puba in the operetta The Mikado, who traced his, uh, his heritage to a primordial protoplasmic globule. And I was waiting for this guy to turn into one, but they never got to that point. Eventually, you'll be relieved to know that he was saved by the love of his wife. Nothing like the love of a good woman. If you look at the coverage of sensory deprivation or rest in introductory psych texts, which uh, I and a friend and colleague uh, published in 1989, you will see that from 1956 to 1986, when we stopped the study, the negative references tended to decrease for the most part, uh, negative emotion didn't, it was not significantly different, but uh, fewer, fewer textbooks said it was intolerable or, or that there were cognitive decrements. None of them said psychosis, uh, about half, many, half as many referred to solitary confinement and so on. On the other hand, the more positive comments increased, so uh, balanced, meaning there was both positive and negative, and the others went up quite a bit. But you notice that even 30 years after the McGill experiments, a third of the references were still to those experiments. Now think about any other topic in psychology or any of the other sciences 
where 30 years later they were still primarily quoting studies that had been done back then. Uh, I don't think you can find very many. And we also found, as time went on, that the number of textbooks that referred to it at all went down. And my, our interpretation was that the reason they went down was because it wasn't so dramatic anymore. Okay? You know, you float somebody and their blood pressure goes down. That's not nearly as exciting as squirrels marching across the visual field. Right? <laughs> not worth mentioning. Okay, in the last decade, what happened? Well, both commercial facilities and research spread around the world more. Uh, lots of facilities in Australia and Europe and so on. FDA Model 2 was organized, international conferences like this one. And the two branches of uh, the commercial and the scientific, uh, scientific slash um, therapeutic, uh, have, are seem to be connecting much better than they had back when the first FDA and IRIS um, worked, which was almost in isolation. So the fibromyalgia study that many of the uh, uh, commercial facilities are engaged in providing data for scientific analysis is, a, a, I think, a marvelous uh, development, and I hope there will be many more of those. Also, uh, especially in Sweden, uh, at least as far as I know, uh, there have been a number of studies which basically replicated the research from the 80s or so, uh, but with better controls, more subjects, and so on. Um, so the things that the reviewers were calling for back in the 80s seem to be getting moving, um, although I'm not sure that the Swedish scientists who are doing that research are aware of the fact that they're replicating earlier work. Um, and then the, new, the developments in things like uh, scanning devices and so forth, I think, are very promising in terms of uh, actually pinning down uh, why we're getting the effects we're getting. I have some suggestions for the future. Um, continuing the systematic replications and extensions uh, with good controls and good measures and proper statistical analyses and all the rest. And I think we need to test the boundaries. Try to see what things there are that REST doesn't work for. And that would allay the fear of some people that what we're dealing with is a placebo. Placebos work on everything, okay? If REST works on everything, maybe that's what it is. Now, we did many studies showing that it was not a placebo. But if people are convinced that it is, it's very hard to convince them otherwise, even if you have data. Meta-analyses would help, and good reviews of the literature would help. And then, of course, you can expand uh, the, the things you try, things you tested on, and the, the uh, as I said, the, the uh, collaboration between commercial tank facilities and researchers. And I've always liked Neil Miller's motto. Neil Miller was a very eminent, in fact, sort of the father of health psychology and behavioral medicine, a professor at Yale who said, we should be courageous in what we try and cautious in what we claim. I've always liked that one, and I think we should adopt that. So here's some more stuff about where, somebody asked, you know, where we go forward from here. Well, this is one place we can go forward. I love this one, the man-eating clamshell. <laughs> Would you get into that? No, I'm not so sure. You know, I'm a scuba diver, and I've seen clams like that, and I sure as <laughs> hell wouldn't go near them, but. Here's another one, uh, the isophone. And this, uh, this is uh, being described as a mechanism whereby the person can communicate with somebody else and totally concentrate on the communication because there's nothing else in the environment. Interesting idea. And last but not least, rest in interstellar space flight. Wouldn't that be fun? If you'd like to volunteer, uh, I'll have a sign-up sheet later on. <laughs> and that, as the slide says, is the end. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Peter Sutfeld. Um, we actually have a couple minutes for some questions, if anyone wants to ask a couple questions. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, so the question was, what do you think REST might not work on? Well, <clears throat> I have to admit that so far, everything I've tried it on, it worked. Um, I think I'll leave that to the next generation of researchers. I really don't know. What? Is still yeah, I think I think that the um, um, the fact that the the rest operators have totally ignored chamber rest is a mistake. Um, in many of the facilities, you could add a chamber, um, and the chambers are not terribly expensive. You can get prefab ones, or you can make your own. Uh, get, you need a room with some soundproofing, and a bed, um, some food container, water container, chemical toilet, and an intercom, and that's it. That's not very expensive, it's, it's cheaper than a tank. And you can rely, you can, you can cite controlled, systematic, large sample research that it works on habit modification for people who want to change. And there are people who'd like to quit smoking and for whom you know, the gum and the patch and all that aren't working. Uh, there are people who'd like to lose weight. Uh, there are people who'd like to stop overeating and so on. Also, uh, the research that Henry Adams did on uh, people who were just short of being alcoholics, um, but they're drinking way too much, people might want to stop that. So you could try uh, a vast number of things, drugs as well. Um, and it would add certainly to the scientific credibility of the situation and also do a lot of good for the patients and also establish the, uh, the commercial end, end of, the, of the REST enterprise in a new area of application. So I think it's, uh, it would be good for, for some people to try that. To what extent do you see behavioral modification being a prohibited fit for the commercial environment? The, the what? The, the, the behavior modification programs and the capabilities of REST. Well, why would it not be? I'm just going to repeat the questions for everyone. Um, oh, that's okay. Um, the question was, uh, in, in what way do you find behavioral modification to be appropriate in a uh, commercial setting? Yeah. Well, my answer would be, if somebody comes to you and says, um, I'm very tense and I have chronic pain, is there anything wrong with floating them? By the same token, if somebody comes to you and says, I would like to stop smoking, but I haven't been able to, what would be wrong with putting them in the chamber for 24 hours? Yeah, do, do you see any need for a specialist to be a part of that? Um, I don't, know. Any more than you'd need a specialist for the person with uh, uh, tension, tension pain in the muscle. I mean, you're not giving them medical treatment, right? What you are doing is giving them 24 hours in a relaxing environment. I, think I don't think you need any specialists for that. Yes, I think that's true, and I, but I don't think it's any more true than how you promote other medical or quasi-medical applications. I mean, I've, I've seen advertisements from tank facilities talking about insomnia, uh, headache, and so on and so forth. So, same, same thing, basically. If one is wrong, then the other is wrong. If one is right, then the other is right. I don't see any difference. <laughs> So the question was, how would you recommend we facilitate more quality research? Well, I think that the fibromyalgia study is a very nice model. Um, it's a way of building up fairly large sample sizes and sample sizes that are not restricted to any one particular vicinity or any particular um, type of uh, subject. And, um, and also doesn't need very much government money, which is nice because governments are pretty tight these days for research money, even on mainstream kinds of studies, much less something like REST. So I think the, the collaboration between uh, researchers and the commercial facilities is, a, is an excellent model. Now, I think also that once, once the model is in place, the participants can uh, be expanded. That is, I'm sure there are people who are not uh, rest researchers to begin with, I, mean, I know there are because I've spoken to many, uh, who are not re rest researchers themselves, but they're medical researchers 
or uh, clinical psychology researchers uh, who would be happy to get involved in something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the idea of chamber rest is to minimize sensory input, just like in the, just like in the tank. So you lie on a bed, uh, you don't get up off the bed unless you have to use the chemical toilet. Um, the food is right there by your bedside and so is the water. And you stay there until the end of the, of the uh, uh, rest period. Why 24 hours for the rest yeah. period was the question. Yeah, um, we've done some, we've done a parametric study uh, with smoking cessation and we found that 24 hours gets the maximum effect. So if you get, le if you use less than 24, uh, there's not as much smoking reduction. And if you use more than 24, I think we only went up to 40 or 48 or 72, um, <clears throat> the results are the same as with 24. So 24 seems to be a, a good point at which to to set the time. Uh, you don't want to use, you don't want to put them in for longer than necessary uh, if it doesn't, it doesn't improve the results. And uh, obviously you don't want to put them in for shorter if you don't get the results. Now I don't know whether 24 hours is optimal for everything, um, but it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's convenient, you know, um, subjects can schedule themselves to spend 24 hours away from whatever else this, they're doing in their life. If you do it longer, it gets more difficult for them. Mostly so because that's what our data show. Why do, I, <laughs> why do I think that chamber rest is more effective for behavior mod than flotation? We've done flotation, I've tried, I've tried flotation studies on smoking, it didn't work at all. Um, so, and, and we know that it does work with the chamber. So I assume, yeah, one could, one could try uh, flotation for some of these other things and other, um, other of the behavior modification issues um, maybe they work for the others, but they certainly don't work for smoking. Just to follow up on that, uh, what was the time periods for the flotation in comparison to the chamber rest? Uh, time period for flotation was the usual, about an hour. The temperature in the chamber is a kind of comfortable room temperature. Okay, and we probably have time for just one more question. Did the rest tables reduce the sleep time, or did they just make it longer for I'm sorry. I, um, in the rest chambers, was there just pure silence, or was there some sort of other audio program playing for them? Oh, um, <coughs> it varied. In the, uh, the weight reduction study that I showed the slide off, um, <coughs> putting weight reduction type messages in with, into the chamber helped. With smoking, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, we've, tried, we've tried that. And we tried message by themselves, <coughs> messages in the chamber, chamber by itself, and the chamber by itself and the messages within the chamber were about the same, had the same effect. So the messages didn't make much difference. Didn't make any difference. Um, since we are getting a lot of questions about the chamber rest specifically, do you have like a particular resource um, or uh, some area where people can learn just more about chamber rest in particular and the logistics of it, I guess? Seems you can to be. buy my book. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, somebody showed me a copy earlier today and said that you can get them from Amazon, um, but they only have a few copies and they're 150 bucks each. Uh, they were about 30 when I wrote them. And I got royalties on the 30. I never got royalties on the 150. Uh, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, libraries may have it. That, that was basically the most solid review of the literature up to that time, which is 1980. And there hasn't been that much chamber research since. Um, and it's all in you know scattered journals. So I don't know. That, that's all I can say, I guess. Sorry. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. Another round.